The 80s had the general. The 90s had John Gilligan. In the noughties, it was the reign of Martin Marlowe Highland. His was a familiar path with success and power and then the recklessness. He had to go because with him, an innocent young man doing an honest day's work died. Crime World presents Caught in the Crossfire, the unsolved murders of coke kingpin Marlowe Highland and innocent Anthony Campbell. Available now on all podcast platforms. Jeff, you're Vice President of Exhibits and Programmes at the Mob Museum, which is a career that follows your own lengthy career in journalism as an author. Um, I think probably that's where you found your interest in organised crime and your love of the subject. Yeah, I uh, I had uh, taken an interest in Las Vegas history as a journalist here. I found myself more interested in, you know, sort of what happened in the past than what was happening today. <laughs> And um, and so I found myself in the morgue of the newspaper, you know, digging through the clips and in the process, you know, when you're learning about Las Vegas history, you're inevitably learning about the, the mob's involvement with Las Vegas. And so it really, uh, really started with that. Yeah. And I suppose the reason we're we're talking today is I have actually just returned from Vegas and finally got to see the Mob Museum, which I've been something on my bucket list for quite some time. So we really want to just talk about it, explain what is there and what can be seen for anybody from these shores who'll be visiting uh, Nevada and Vegas over the next while. Um, it's a kind of a, a trip that lots of Irish people take every you know, you kind of need a break of about five years, I think, in between every time you go to Vegas, uh, especially when you're trying to pack everything into it. But the Mob Museum, I think what people will take away from it is how organised crime really started with prohibition. That's when it was born. And there's a very interesting kind of run into prohibition and the history of it. Um, it involves, I suppose, uh mass immigration to the US and the likes of the Irish who had a fondness of whiskey, the Italians with their wine and the Germans with their beer and a bit of a hysteria that grew up around drinking, didn't it? And and uh, a woman's movement uh, emerged from it, blaming all the ills of their household on, on drink. So just explain a little bit about that and how it came to being. Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing that you know, people may not, may not realize is just how much more alcohol people drank in the past than we do today. Um, when you go back to the 19th century and you look at sort of average alcohol consumption, it was way more than even your your most uh, 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 alcohol leaning person today would drink. Um, and and so this was creating a problem in America, frankly, uh, where uh, men were. Uh, spending a lot of time outside the house. They weren't taking care of things at home. Uh, you know, they were becoming alcoholics. They were not working. Uh, these, I, I think we should be somewhat sympathetic <laughs> to these families uh, who were pushing for prohibition because, in fact, it was becoming a problem. Mm. So as the turn of the, turn of the 20th century, uh, the, the push for temperance for, for prohibition laws really accelerated and uh, with the pa- ultimately with the passage in 1919 of, of federal uh, prohibition on alcohol. And it was a movement that really um, came out of like the Midwest, American Midwest, uh, Protestant uh, small towns and small cities. Uh, it was not popular in big cities. Naturally, it was not popular in Chicago. It was not popular in New York. Uh, uh, place like Milwaukee, where Germans were so prominent uh, that it, it did not go over well there. But but from a popular vote standpoint, it, it passed and um, sort of the race was on to figure out how to provide booze illegally and uh, organized crime as it existed at that time was was perfectly situated to to take care of that for people. And do you have any idea why people drank more? Was it cheaper? Was it, uh, you know, there wasn't obviously the health warnings that there are nowadays, etc. But was there a particular reason and was it just unique to the U.S. that that was happening? You know, I don't know that it was unique to the U.S. I think that it, it, you, you alluded to this earlier that 
you know, there was there's a lot of tradition involved with alcohol, you know, with the Italians with wine and Germans with beer and so forth. And and I think it in a kid, you know, people would drink at a younger age uh, than than they do now um, legally. And um, they, uh, you know, it, it, it was part kind of part of the culture uh, to drink. And and then I think industrialization in America, you know, in the late 1800s led to a lot of stress, a lot of guys working very long hours, six days a week. Uh, they needed, uh, they felt a release after all of this this hard, grimy work. This is not unique to the U.S. either. Mm. Uh, but uh, they were looking for a release, and, and the saloons were a very, very popular uh, place for them to go. They should have gone home, right, and and played with their kids and uh, and had a proper meal, but instead they would oftentimes end up in the saloons. And of course, women maybe weren't allowed into the the saloons. They were banned. That's right. Uh, at that time, anyway, uh, that changed with prohibition. Interestingly enough, but the uh, before that, certainly saloons were were men only uh, kind of affairs. So, for the decade or so that prohibition existed, organized crime really became literally very organized. You had key players there who were uh, bootlegging, supplying speakeasies that popped up in all these cities with uh, with drink and all sorts of other sort of elements of organized crime came out of that. Would you say the likes of prostitution rackets and et cetera? And I suppose really just the general networking of criminal groupings and the logistics of of crime and, you know, the transport and all those sort of tactics that are used nowadays largely in drug dealing were born then? I, I would say yes. Uh, I I think it's important to note that there were organized crime groups before prohibition. Uh, but as uh, sometimes I've said, you know, what prohibition did is it turned street hoodlums into millionaires. <laughs> Literally, you went from, you know, making really small money robbing people on the street or, or or running prostitution rings or something like that to now uh, owning really the means of production of uh, for alcohol, as well as the entire sort of verticality of it, right? You owned the, the everything from the sugar that went into the making of it all the way up through the sale of it in speakeasies. And, and you, uh, these guys were unbelievably uh, wealthy as a result of this, some of them could handle it and some of them couldn't. Uh, violence and, and rivalry were, were rampant. There was a great difficulty in, in uh, keeping the peace among the rival bootleggers. However, uh, what you, as you, as you mentioned, what you started seeing were networks developing. And you had to, uh, one of the things that happened during prohibition in America was very uh, popular was was rum running, right? So you would get the good stuff from, you know, Ireland or Scotland or England, and you would ship it over. Uh, and then it would, there'd be a rendezvous point in Canada, let's say, and then you would smuggle it into the U S mm. you might do the same thing from Canada overland or, or over the, the great lakes and bring that into Detroit and then to Chicago. And you needed, uh, organized crime groups in different regions, different cities to work together to make this happen. And so that's, you know, prohibition definitely regionalized uh, organized crime and and in some ways nationalized it. Mm. And you had obviously the, the better quality of booze coming in um, yeah. from abroad, but you also had local hooch being created, which was far more dangerous. Oh, the uh, <laughs> that's the thing, right? I mean, everything that was made locally uh, was not as good. Uh, it was typically not aged, right? So it was moonshine. Uh, for the most part, or it was beer and not very good beer. And it um, it was affordable. That was what most people ended up with. But if you were a person of some means in America, you wanted the good stuff, as they would say. And so that would usually come in from uh, either from Europe or from Canada or from the Caribbean. And uh, so rum running was a huge, and, and organized crime had the upper hand at first, in part because they had the faster boats. Um, uh, the the U.S. government did not have much of a means of of dealing with rum running until they they started uh, uh, acquiring faster boats and and better plans for 
uh, intercepting messages and th- things like that in order to disrupt these rum running routes. I mean, you could be talking about uh, the the fight against organised crime today as much as you are talking about it a hundred years ago. All those issues are in in the same um, causing problems. But uh, J. Edgar Hoover established the Federal Bureau of Investigation as the sort of to fight back against this. Well, I don't think so. Um, You know, there was the Prohibition Bureau, uh, which was fighting uh, uh, Pro, you know, fighting bootleggers. Uh, and then you had the uh, Bureau of Investigation, uh, which was really mostly accountants and lawyers uh, that, and J. Edgar Hoover's sort of plan to, uh, uh, was that they would do sort of white collar investigations. That was always his thing until uh, about 1934. Mm. 1934, we're after Prohibition now. And we start seeing the rise of these outlaws like John Dillinger and Bonnie and Clyde and George Machine Gun Kelly. These are, are, you know, bandits, basically. They're bank robbers, they're kidnappers, and they're they're really described in America as public enemies. And, And Hoover was thrust upon him basically by the Attorney General, Homer Cummings, at that time. He said, we need uh, the Fed, federal law enforcement to go after these guys. We cannot rely any longer on small police departments around to deal with these public menaces. So uh, Hoover and his FBI agents had to learn how to shoot guns. They had to uh, uh, come up with tactics to deal with bad guys that didn't involve paperwork. And they were, frankly, very successful. Uh, And it wasn't the most democratic way of doing things, but they ended up shooting down and killing people like Dillinger and Babyface Nelson and others. And this is how the FBI developed its reputation uh, as a crime fighting force was not fighting the mob, uh, but fighting uh, these outlaws, these individual bandits. Um, And uh, it was only later uh, that uh, the FBI took an interest in organized crime. In fact, uh, Hoover uh, avoided it. And one of the reasons he avoided uh, dealing with with organized crime or even admitting it existed uh, was that he was concerned that his uh, agents could be mixed up in it, that they could be corrupted in some way. Um, And so he focused on other things like, you know, alleged communists (laughs) and uh, other things like that. Uh, And he really wanted to do what the CIA did. Ultimately, Uh, he wanted to go into international intrigue, but he. He was uh, thwarted in that effort. And of course, the, the corruption that you've mentioned had seeped in with prohibition because, of course, the gangs were paying off police officers to turn a blind eye to the speakeasies. As an aside, I spent an evening in Vegas uh, rooting out some of these speakeasies and some of the big hotels. Now, they're a tourist thing, I presume. They were not original speakeasies. No. 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 Yeah. So, and was there... Was there actually speakeasies in Vegas? Because we'll come along to how how Vegas fits into it all. But maybe before we do that, we'll just say that after Prohibition, the mob moved to new criminal opportunities. The mobs had been developed, created and were very organised structures with um, headmen and with, you know, probably a, a corporate structure underneath them. They moved into, you know, drugs immediately, didn't they? And and into sports fixing and, uh, you know, extortion schemes and, and everything else that they, they got their, their hands dirty with. Absolutely. The, you know, with, with the end of prohibition, uh, the mob needed new ways to make money and to continue their enterprises and they found them. Mm. Uh, uh, probably first and foremost was illegal gambling. Um, so outside of Nevada, gambling was illegal all over the country. And the mob, but it was happening, just like with Prohibition, that drinking alcohol was happening. Uh, and the mob ran most of the illegal gambling operations all over the country in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, so then, you know, uh, drugs, drugs, was, it's a big misnomer to think that uh, that the mob was uh, not selling drugs, not involved in the drug trafficking business, because they were as early as the uh, during Prohibition in the late 20s. Uh, Arnold Rothstein, uh, you know, sort of infamously was, uh, you know, bringing in heroin and uh, and and distributing that in the U.S. So you know, drugs was a was was hap- where they were happening uh, very early on, uh, and then you know like um, uh, labor racketeering, 
you know, controlling unions uh, became a big thing. Uh, coin operated machines like jukeboxes and cigarette machines and all of those things, the mob ran those. Anything that had to do with cash, right? Any kind of a cash business, the mob wanted wanted in on it. And that really brings us to Las Vegas, I suppose, there. They didn't create Las Vegas. They just saw an opportunity there. Um, what is the history of, of Vegas and how does it become this sort of gambling capital of the U.S.? So, you know, and, and yes, thank you for asking that and, and putting it that way, because no, the mob did not invent Las Vegas. Uh, Las Vegas started as a railroad town. Uh, the railroad was connected uh, between Los Angeles, California and Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, roughly the midway point of that route was Las Vegas. And so they built a train depot here and a stop for uh, for and they had a staff of, of uh, employees, you know, railroad employees here. They uh, built a town site. This is all in 1905 uh, when this happened. Las Vegas, a very young city. And uh, a town grew up. They had a, an auction on May 15th, 1905. And uh, people came from California, from Utah, from elsewhere on the train to come and bid on lots in this little town that was going to be created. And they did. And a little town sprouted up, maybe a thousand people, not a lot. Uh, and it was a place that was served primarily. It was a place that served mining people mostly. There was a lot of mining, gold and silver mining and copper mining going on in central Nevada. And they needed they had a lot of little railroad spurs shot up into Nevada from Las Vegas. And they would bring their ore to Las Vegas. And then they would go on down to Southern California uh, to be assayed and sold. And they would come and these guys were working out there in the middle of the desert for months at a time. So when they came to Las Vegas, they wanted to have a good time for a couple of days. And they did. Las Vegas immediately was service oriented, if you will, mm -hmm. and uh, provided a lot of a uh, lot of evening activities for people. In 1931, two things happened of great import. Uh, the first thing that happened was the legalization of gambling in Nevada. Um, this was during the Great Depression, and Nevada was looking for a new, uh, you know, mining was was started going down. Uh, they were looking for a new economic stimulus in the in the state, so gambling was legalized. Now, Las Vegas and Reno, in particular, uh, benefited from this and started opening casinos. Um, and then the second thing that happened, and even more important, really, was the beginning of construction of Hoover Dam. And, and, and this brought literally thousands of people to the Las Vegas Valley. Keep in mind, at this point in 1930-31, Las Vegas is still not a very big place. But it's the Depression. There are very good, high-paying jobs that are going to be available on the construction of this dam. And so people are flocking to Las Vegas. So during the 1930s, while the rest of the country, much of the rest of the country was suffering through the Great Depression, Las Vegas overall wasn't doing too badly. And uh, because of the Hoover Dam project, and then ultimately uh, things sped upon that, and you started seeing the rise of casino gambling here, um, the mob really didn't take serious notice of Las Vegas until the 40s during World War II. And that's when you see the arrival of uh, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Mo Sedway, uh, people like that from New York who were like, oh, this is a way for us to, to operate casinos legally without having always, you know, always being worried about, you know, a, a police raid. Mm. And did that change Vegas significantly? Did it make it more sophisticated maybe because I suppose it all started down in Freeman Street which mm -hmm. I mean trying to imagine it back then you know it's such a modern blaze of neon lights and uh, you know fake grooves and everything you can imagine is there but it must have been a much smaller obviously and, and different place like when the mob arrived did everything start going really big? It did you know the uh Two things happened in the 40s that are important. Uh, the mob's arrival is one. The other is the World War II, naturally. And there was a great deal of defense spending that occurred in Las Vegas and created another population boom here. Mm. You know, we had, a new, we had the Army Air Base that now is Nellis Air Force Base. 
uh, uh, happened. There was a lot of training of you know bombers and other pilots. Uh, and then there also was a magnesium plant that went in here, magnesium being a very important metal uh, used in war, uh, war material. So it brought thousands and thousands more people here. This took this definitely caught the attention of the mob, and they saw an opportunity for Las Vegas to become much more than locals had really imagined it to be. They saw a resort destination uh, that would draw people from Hollywood, would draw people from, you know, from all over the country who were accustomed to much nicer lodgings, uh, much nicer, better restaurants. Um, uh, wanted to dress up for for the showrooms, uh, for the performances. And so in the 1940s, you have the opening of the El Rancho Vegas. That's the first hotel on Highway 91. And today we know High New, Highway 91 is the Las Vegas Strip. Mm. Uh, but at the time, it was the highway to Los Angeles. And El Rancho Vegas was the first. That opened in 41. Then the Hotel Last Frontier opened in 1942. And then the most important development from a mob standpoint, was the opening of the Flamingo Hotel in 1946. And that's when the mob really cements its place in Las Vegas. And of course, that still stands and exists. It's still called the Flamingo and is uh, now just full of slot machines and wall-to-wall gambling tables. It's quite a chaotic place, actually, the Flamingo. Um when do the other, maybe more sophisticated hotels start opening up and do the mob have anything to do with them? Or Yeah, I would say the, the when you when we go back to the El Rancho Vegas and the Last Frontier, those hotels had very much like an Old West motif to them. They're, they were still playing off of the Old West kind of mindset. And so they were not real fancy. Um, they were uh, almost like, you know, like dude ranches, if you can imagine that. Mm. Whereas the Flamingo had a much, much greater elegance. Uh, it was a well, well-made well uh, casino. Uh, yeah, the, the buildings were were uh, very elegant. The, the restaurants were nice. The showrooms were beautiful. And this really kicked off a whole spree of additional hotels that opened in the late 40s and the early 50s. Most of them had a mob mob element to them. Mm. There was a Thunderbird Hotel opened in 48. The Desert Inn Hotel, which was uh, really took a step up from the Flamingo, and that was the Cleveland mob was behind that. Mo Dalitz, most famously, uh, was behind the Desert Inn. Uh, that's where the Wynn Hotel is today, by the way. Mm. Uh, but the Desert Inn was a, was definitely an iconic uh, uh, you know, sign on the Strip for many, many years. And then you had the opening of the Sands Hotel, uh, later made famous by the Rat Pack uh, and the Sahara and the Riviera and the Stardust and the Tropicana, which recently closed. And the Caesar and the really at the very top of this opened in 1966 was Caesar's Palace. Yeah, absolutely incredible structure, really. Um, you know, not maybe everybody's taste, but just a extraordinary building to look at and to, to wander through. Um, so in all this time, the the mob are sort of washing money and, um, you know, enjoying themselves really as well in Vegas, as well as everything else. And they're kind of rubbing shoulders with celebrities, which, of course, they like to do. It gives them legitimacy. Um, at what point does Vegas decide uh, it wants to clean up its image and, you know, move away from the mob and maybe move the mob out? Yeah, I, I believe that started uh, that mindset started to take hold in the 1970s. And before that, um, there were a couple of things that were worth mentioning. One is one of the things that the mob brought to Las Vegas was expertise, mm -hmm. right? These guys had been running illegal casinos all over the country uh, for years. They knew how to run a casino. And who else knew how to run a casino? Because they were it was illegal, right? So you had to bring in these folks. So there was a mindset uh, uh, in the certainly in the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s, that you know these the guys who had come here from operating illegal casinos were grandfathered in, so to speak. They were uh, they we needed their expertise. We understood that they had a, a notorious past, but we were going to look past that as long as they uh, you know kept their nose clean in Las Vegas. In the 1970s, you saw a mindset change with the election of Governor Michael Callahan uh, that said, 
you know what? Uh, the mob served its purpose in Las Vegas, but now they're only they're just hurting us now. We don't they're not helping. You know, um, in 1969, there was the passage of uh, gaming uh, law in Nevada that said corporations could now own casinos. And the Corporate Gaming Act changed a lot because it said no longer would it have to be these individual operators who could run the casinos. It could be an entire corporation. And uh, so you started seeing the movement away from the mob and toward these more of a Wall Street mentality. There's, no, there's pros and cons to that culturally, but from a financial standpoint, it, it definitely was a step away from the mob. And then you had on the enforcement side, that's where Governor O'Callaghan hired a number of uh, uh, very aggressive regulators in the gaming control area, and they started rooting out the skimming that was going on. Um, the, on, on a parallel track, in the late 70s, you had the FBI take a renewed interest in Las Vegas and in, in again, rooting out the skimming uh, that was going on uh, at so many of the casinos at that time. So things started to change in the 70s, and this is sort of reflected very, very well in uh, the movie Casino. Mm -hmm. And of course, then by the sort of the 80s, the um, the interest is in the what keeps these mobs together, what are the kind of the glue and what are their strengths. And of course, the discovery of really that they are this blood organizations, really, where where members have to become made men and where there's initiation ceremonies often. There was some sort of a, a, a wiretap, was there, in the 1980s, where it was discovered that um, certainly the Sicilian mafias were held together by this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, overriding sense of omerta. You never speak, you never work with the authorities, no matter what is happening or who has done what on you. Um, and that understanding, I think, probably led to the dismantlement, really, of a lot of the mobs. Yeah, I think the two that, that the two things that I would would pinpoint from the eighties. Uh, the first is the RICO Act. So the the in nineteen seventy, uh, Congress passed a law that said that you could prosecute a group of criminal associates without having to prove that each member of that group had committed specific crimes. Right? They just were part of a conspiracy. Uh, and so they were they could be prosecuted just for being part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and the RICO Act wasn't really acted upon very heavily uh, by prosecutors in the 70s until the late 70s and then into the 80s when you had these really high profile RICO trials that took down um, you know vast swaths of mafia and mob members all over the country. So that's the first thing. Uh, and then the second thing related is that this this idea of omerta, which had uh, been so uh, uh, well practiced, if you will, in organized crime for for years, broke down, mm. and you started to see a lot of guys flipping, becoming government witnesses, becoming informants, uh, you know, basically snitching, as they say, uh, in the criminal world. And they weren't they were no longer willing to sort of take their medicine and go to prison because one reason was the prison sentences were becoming so much longer. When you look back at the 20s and 30s, if someone were uh, in the in the mob was busted, uh, they might serve a year and a half, two years, whatever. And they were willing to do that and say nothing. Right. To you know, keep quiet and then probably go back to the to the organized crime group after they got out. But now in the 80s, you're starting to see sentences of 10, 20, 30 years for fairly uh, modest crimes, if you will. And and guys are not willing to do that. Suddenly, well, if you give me a better sentence, I'll talk. Yeah. And so that really that really hurt them up. I find it extraordinary that some of them are, are now talking all the time as podcasters. <laughs> There's this yes. new new career for these uh, people oh who've my. broken Omerta and who have gone witness against many of their former colleagues. And look, all these sort of stories and, and these um, threads are put together in such a fantastic way in the Mob Museum. It's such a great experience, not just if you're, you know, like me, 
so interested in organised crime. But I mean, I visited with people who probably wouldn't really pay much heed to organised crime or have much interest in it. And I found them absolutely as fascinated as I was. Um, you've all sorts of exhibitions and, and places to visit and uh, stories to read up on, including like where do old mobsters go? What happens them? Some of them, yes, go into witness protection. Some of them uh die, some of them go on the run and all the rest of it. Um, there's there's picture parades really of the mobsters, the kind of most significant ones, who they were, where they came from and what was their fate. You you put together obviously all these exhibitions. You have to keep this story very relevant. But what I found was rather than glamorising a lot of it, throughout the Mob Museum, there is the reminder about the victims. There's the reminder about the fact that these guys said they only killed one another. No, they didn't. There's been plenty of innocent victims caught up in it as well. Um, and, and a sort of, you know, breaking down a lot of those myths, that narrative that's been put out by these mafias themselves. No, thank you for saying that. First of all, thank you for saying such nice things about our museum. We're, we're very uh, glad to hear you you enjoyed it. Um, uh, there's a couple of things that you've, you've hit on perfectly. Uh, one is that uh, we, it's a, we, are, we are striving for a very balanced story. So we do not want to glamorize crime. Uh, we have, we'll tell you the stories. We'll tell you about these individuals, some of whom had a fair amount of charisma. Uh, you know, they were in the headlines for a reason. People uh, took an interest in Al Capone or Lucky Luciano or whomever. But ultimately, they're criminals, and ultimately, they're hurting other people. And they're also hurting Las Vegas, by the way. If you think about all that skimming that went on, that's all money that would have otherwise been taxed in Nevada and would have helped to pay for roads and schools and everything else that you know a city needs. So yeah, the, the mob is, is taking away from someone else. And sometimes it's a life, when the most extreme example, sometimes it's merely money but they are bad people. And so part of our story, uh, the other part of our story is the law enforcement side and about how the, the mob operated, but also how law enforcement responded to them. Mm -hmm. And so we, we spent a lot of time on that in our exhibits. And then, as you mentioned, the third element, which are the victims. Uh, there are individuals um, who are literally innocent victims and that we wanted to be sure to, to make note of that you know, there's this old saying that Bugsy Siegel uh, said, uh, uh, and I think he probably did say it. Uh, he said, we only kill each other. Mm. Well, that's not true. And uh, it, there's, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of uh, mob hits and mob shootings and mob uh, confrontations in which innocent victims uh, were, were killed. It's uh, not unlike any other kind of violence uh, that we see today or in the past where, you know, there's always going to be other people who get in the way. Mm. And uh, it's, 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 it's a very ugly thing. And finally, I suppose for people who won't get to visit Vegas or the museum, you have a really comprehensive website there. And I couldn't help but noticing there was a little story about one of our own, Christy Kinahan, on it. So these modern day sort of mob bosses are, you know, being sort of, I suppose, reflected there because you can't change the museum and the exhibitions all the time. We are uh, uh, very conscious of what's happening today with organized crime. Uh, we do public programs uh, in our courtroom on a regular basis, some of which go back and look at history and um, we have a good time with that. They're very popular with our guests. But we also tackle modern uh, organized crime topics, whether it's cybercrime or drug trafficking or uh, you know human trafficking, all the different ways in which organized crime continues to be an issue today. And we also do have an, an organized crime today exhibit that it, it, we'd like it to be evolve even quicker than it has. But it's designed uh, to stay updated. And um, and then, as you mentioned, on our website, we have our blog where uh, we try to keep track of what's going on uh, all over the world. And, um, and uh, you know, we're, 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 we're not comprehensive or anything like that. There are some other websites uh, and news organizations that, uh, that do a tremendous job about on that, and it's, like yours. It can, uh, 
it but, continues uh, to be an ever evo- an ever evolving world organized crime i think and keeps us all earning an honest living through crime yeah and it's it's surprising in some ways right it's like the same some of this as you mentioned earlier some of the same things that were happening you know 100 years ago are essentially still happening today the technology might be a little different, but it's essentially the same thing. The faces too are slightly different, but yeah. nonetheless. Well, Jeff Schumacher, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.